right now, consider it, uh, you got your cutting down, um, the liner's been planted, you got your roots in the new media, we got to build a nice base and foundation. And the way we do that is keeping even moisture. So we're trying to get from our, our left pitcher where we're just rooting out, we're doing a little bit of a pinch. Right now we're looking towards developing some older roots into the middle here. And then finally, of course, when we get closer to finish, we should have a nice, healthy, thick root system. All right, some do's and don'ts. So just like I said, we're, we're building on a, a foundation. We want to stay in the middle of the road on moisture, okay? Uh, being too wet because uh, you don't want to go check the moisture later in the day is, is not acceptable. You're going to drown out all the air the roots need and, and the free space they need to grow into, okay? This is not a time, I know it's hot out in the greenhouse, but you got to try to get to a nice schedule where you're checking in the morning and you're checking uh, probably right after your mid-morning break and then early in the afternoon. We want to try and get the water on early in the, uh, as possible. That way we're avoiding any overhead watering late in the day when it's extremely hot in the foliage. And we're burning off potentially with the fertilizer tips, causing phosphorus uh, deformation all sorts of issues, okay? Not, not to mention late watering jacks your humidity le levels up. And when we and get that past the pinch. Uh, major concern is you controlling your humidity as your canopy begins to close. All right, think, and that's a way of keeping uh, disease control, but we'll, we'll uh, touch on that a little bit more, a little bit later. Um, and also make sure you're not gonna be the one seven days a week watering, right? So make sure that you, <laughs> you and your, your growing team or, or your, uh, your partner there uh, that's helping you check a couple times the weekend, you're speaking the same language when you talk about watering and water weight of a pot, all right? And, you know, for example, just go out with the grower and, and yourself and pick up pots together, all right? So you guys can compare and yep. know. This is one of the ways, especially growing uh, mums and poinsettias, I really like the medium moisture scale. That way we can say, hey man, I know what a three is. Yeah. Um, and, and that was really Will Hilly's uh, developed for growing plugs. But in this situation, it, it's a uh, good language to also use in a finished pot. All right, we want to avoid growing a dry. Excessive dry downs, just like being too excessively wet, um, can damage and cause a shock and then allows pythium and other root diseases to go into the root system. Yeah, I would, I would, I, you know, I'd have to say that I would say the number one cause of pythium in poinsettias is, is a hard dry down. It stresses oh, the plants and, and there, if you know poinsettia roots, you can see they're nice and big, thick and fleshy. And as soon as they dry down, uh, they, they die, they fry off. And then you have these dead roots. If you do dry down hard, do not go out there and go, oh crap, they're all dry. Let's water them really, really good and saturate them. That is just a, a recipe for, for root disease. If you do have severe dry down, and I define a severe dry down a poinsettia is the leaves are flagging hard. If the stems are wilting, we have an old saying, if you wilt it, you kilt it. So you never want to let a poinsettia wilt. You can let the leaves flag a little bit. But if you get into a point where they're hard flagging or they're wilting at all, I would recommend that you hydrate them and immediately apply a pythium targeted fungicide. I think Segway is the best rescue product out there. I think, but the other thing is, is the consistency. I think that's so important that, that you be consistent in your water. If you're growing a little bit on the drier side, that's okay. If you grow a little bit on the wetter side, that's okay. But you don't want to go dry on Tuesday drowned on Wednesday. That's just a recipe for pity. Yeah, that, that's easy way to cause issues gotcha. right? and Absolutely. destroy all the work that you've done to this point. And then you're going to spend uh, much more money on your crop doing recovery. And then that'll later get into issues as your root system isn't established. You're, you'll start to worry about your height because you won't get the uh, shoot growth that you're expecting and that you need during this time after the pinch. Absolutely. I, I think this is basically um, phase one of a theme you'll hear repeatedly uh, today is that your best approach to managing your disease issues are managing your moisture in your environment, be the moisture in the media or moisture in the air uh, versus becoming, you know, addicted to a chemical approach. 
poinsettias are sensitive and they're easy to mess up with chemistry too. And uh, especially you mentioned the point of the hard dry down um, that's going to occur in summer. So you're going to have a summer type of pythium going through, yep. which in that case, I know a lot of people have been used to using subdued max, and this is the type of time where, you know, you want to go more with the true band because there is resistance to a summer pythium with subdued max. Yep. High temperature pythium. Um, there are other strains that are resistant, but typically high temperature pythium strains that are active in warmer temperatures tend to have more resistance to subdue, which is a good point. I think subdue is, is still a viable product. I think uh, I've been, you know, using that chemistry my pretty much my entire career. Well, literally my entire career on various crops. And I don't want to see us lose that chemistry. So the, the, the thing that we can't do is if we treat and we see pythium and you treat with subdue, then you have to come in with an alternative chemical to kill that pythium. If you don't you just go hit it again with subdue, all you're doing is rendering a stronger and stronger resistant population. If the subdue is failing, rotate. Even if it isn't failing, rotate. Because this is a great chemistry. It's been one of our most cost-effective um, root disease products. And we do not want to lose it. And right now in certain regions, we just can't even use it on the poinsettia crop. We can't lose any tools on you know, the chemical side. Yeah. They're just not being replaced fast enough, and they're not new modes of actions, especially for drenching. Uh, it's just, yep. uh, as the world progresses, um, it becomes more expensive for the chemical companies to give us new tools as growers. So we have to make sure that we use the ones that we currently have as effectively as possible and increase the longevity of their shelf life. So the ideal irrigation method I would recommend would be drips. and. You know, you can either go with drip tape because that'll also automatically give you your spacing. So you can space it out as long as you create a nice header, um, you know, beginning wise. Or if you're trying to do multiple pot sizes in a greenhouse on a certain run, that's where I would go to more drip tubes. Uh, but at the same time, if you already have drip tubes, maybe it doesn't make the sense for you to invest in drip tape uh, for the year. You know, you're going to have to make that decision on your own, but those are the benefits of both and why as you get later into the season, uh, especially for controlling uh, uh, any moisture in the canopy, uh, that's why I, I prefer drip irrigation, right? And at the same time, again, as you get later in the season, after the pinch, everything and every leaf you unfold um, more of the time when you get into late September, you can see that damage if you have any fertilizer damage from overhead water. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the phosphorus phenomenon is, is a real issue. It's an issue that I know you and I talk about every year because we deal with it every year. I think the other point I want to make about the drips, and again, I'm, I'm like James, I'm a total hardcore drip poinsettia finish guy. But the other thing I would suggest is if you look at your drips, the type of drip you use, an old school high flow chapin is not ideal in the situation. You want a metered flow uh, delivery, either a metered flow uh, emitter on, on the pot or metered flow through drip tape. That allows you to use the tape for, for drenches, especially PGR drenches, where volume is equally as important as the rate. So if you're gonna use any kind of PGR drenching, it's it's really by far the best solution to put it onto a controlled flow, you know, one GPH, half GPH, whatever it is, but a controlled metered flow type of emitter. And that's not to say that sub irrigation is bad. I, mean, no. I used to use flood floors uh, uh, for my finished crop latent season all the time. The, the, you just have to be cognizant of when to use your flood floors and the yeah. humidity that will be remaining as you use it and make sure that you're using that on days where you're not going to be stuck in clouds the whole time right yep. so use your you know use what irrigation system you have they're just benefits uh, uh to using drip and there's also um you know as anything there's pros and cons so i'm gonna i'm gonna tell i'm gonna tell a story and if you're if you're listening um i apologize i won't name you but this is a story, this is one of the concerns you have with a flood floor on, on poinsettias. 
um, uh, one of the common rotations prior to poinsettias is, is growing mums. So this grower was growing a large uh, 10 inch pot mum on the sled floor. And he was, it was warm and they were getting big on him and he started spraying bonsai. He was spraying bonsai at 30 to 50 parts per million regularly. And as he started shipping out of this, he continued to spray. What happened is that spray got onto the floor. In comes the poinsettia crop being spaced right behind that mom crop on that flood on that floor, and then he flooded it, and that bonsai released into that poinsettia crop, and they never moved, not one, not an inch. So be cognizant in a flood floor situation that what is on that floor, if it is soluble, is in the tank. Or if it sticks to the floor, it might wick right up through the roots. So just be aware of what's on the floor. We deal with a lot of growers that also grow vegetable seedlings. And we have very strict non-drenched, um, non-bonsai protocols for these guys because they can't risk any of that, that, that you know, bonsai um, getting into their flood system or onto the floor. So that is one of the things about floods. But if you're, if you're on your game, the other issue with floods is you have to make sure you have proper sanitation and you don't have an active pythium population. Because again, another grower, if you're on the call, I apologize when you won't be named, lost a huge chunk of poinsettias over a weekend due to a fact that the uh, sanitation uh, system for his uh, recovery tank failed and he flooded repeatedly with Pythium water. And as a result, he lost probably 20, 25% of his crop on a weekend to Pythium. So flood floors are very cost effective and a lot of guys use them, but be careful. There's a few caveats there that can burn you.